My name is Lizzie. Hi. I'm kind of freaking out about this like sonic echo around me. Um, I work at a company called Mapbox. Who in here has heard of Mapbox before? All right, cool. So um, at Mapbox, we build um, developer tools for making web maps. Um, and one of the, there's a lot of, you know, mapping companies. Some of you may have heard of Esri, um, CartoDB, uh, Apple, Google. Uh, these are all mapping companies. Uh, one of the things that we try to do at Mapbox is instead of building an end user product, we build different tools that you can kind of put together on top of each other and um, sew together or CEO is calling them Lego blocks, um, put them together to build applications. Uh, and we build on open source components and there's just like a ton of interesting stuff. Um, I was a little stressed out about the two hour slot, but then I realized that I could really talk for a long time about the whole Mapbox deck. And at 11 p.m. last night, I um, realized that like the talk I had, I didn't really like um, because it was just like kind of meandery and strange and whatever. So um, I rewrote it a whole bunch of times, and then you know I made I felt bad, and then I was like, you know, whatever, it's cool. Like writer's block happens, we can figure it out somehow. Um, so I kind of just went stream of consciousness starting at 11 o'clock last night, and I came up with this talk. So I apologize if parts are disjointed or if my slides don't work or if it's not like totally seamless. But I think it's going to be a much more, I've never talked this way before, I think it's going to be really interesting. Organic. Organic, indeed. Um, so we'll see how it goes. Um, I, what I would rather, instead of like a bunch of questions at the end, if I'm saying something and if I'm going to explain a bunch of like concepts, if something doesn't make sense, like please raise your hand, interrupt me um, in the middle while I'm talking, which is like, not normal conference behavior, but I'd much prefer that like we clear out anything confusing when it's happening. Um, and if you have a question but you're feeling cautious about raising your hand, I guarantee you someone else also has that question and they also feel nervous about raising their hand. So I encourage you to just go for it um, because this is a small room, we're all friends and maps are super cool. So the more we can understand about them, the better. Um, so my goal is I'm going to, I want you to walk away with an under, with the, 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 my goal today is for you to walk away understanding a little bit more about open source web mapping than you knew before you came in this room, and maybe a little bit about Mapbox too, which is the company I work for. Um, I also want to reinforce the idea that like maps are really hard, like really, really hard. I do support and a lot of times we get emails from people saying, I'm not a developer, I don't really know anything about computers or technology, but I want to add a map to my website. Can you do that for me? And the answer, we try to find a really nice way to say no <laughs> because they're you know, complicated and technical, but it's like totally worth it once you start to see how the pieces fit together. Um, so like keep digging in even when it gets confusing. Um, so I thought what we could do is actually just start with one of my favorite web maps that one of my colleagues made and kind of walk through how it was made and what the different pieces are that fit together. I think it's a pretty representative example of the like, Lego pieces of open source web maps and web mapping tools. And um, so we'll go through that and kind of see it in pieces. Um, if you would like to follow along with this presentation, I just put it online, uh, so I didn't put the URL on the slides, but it's, um, my name, lizzydiamond.com slash osb-maps. Um, and I can like write it on that white order if you want. But um, I'll also make sure to like put it, give it to you all at the end too, so you can go back and look. Um, so there's a lot of like links and interesting stuff. Oh, um, uh, yeah, lizzydiamond.com slash osb-maps. And then you can use the left and right arrows to um, switch slides. So one thing that I couldn't get to work properly in this format was iframes. Apologies in advance, they're a little bit weird. But So this is a really awesome, amazing, super cool web map that one of my colleagues made. Um, the idea is that you have a starting location in Washington, D.C. <clears throat> and you have an ending location in Washington, D.C. And you want to get there via Capital Bike Share, which is the bike sharing program in, in Washington, D.C. So what this map, with map slash application allows you to do is change your starting location. It finds the nearest bike share. It shows you walking directions and how many bikes are at that station. And then it shows you a bicycle route to the uh, capital bike share station closest to your destination. Incredibly handy if you're walking around DC and you want to get from point A to point B. Super useful. 
Um, and there's a lot of different little components and pieces to this that make it all work together. So we can walk through them and kind of see how it works. Um, so let's talk about what's going on here. So first of all, the entire map itself is housed on the web page in a, in a map container, in a div on the page. Um, and the reason that we have a map container, a place for all of this functionality and styling and everything to go, is because of the web mapping library that we're using uh, here, which is called Mapbox.js. Um, it's a JavaScript library, and it contains a ton of useful web mapping functions, everything like a map constructor, and panning ability, and zoom ability, and interaction. Um, and its uh, main function, like the core of what it does, is it loads map tiles. Who here has heard of a map tile before? Nice, awesome. Um, but some of you are asking, what are map tiles? And that's a very good question. Um, I would be happy to tell you, but you can also stare at this adorable puppy for a second, just like take that all in. Like I said, 11 p.m. Um, so let's go back in time for a second. Let's go back to 1996. Who remembers when MapQuest launched its web service in 96? Who was like totally blown away by this idea? It's insane, right? Like, it, there was actual directions that you could get from the internet from point A to point B. Like, that was huge. And it was online. I was like, what? Crazy. Awesome. But it was really, really slow. And I mean, not even just slow because the internet was a lot slower in 1996, but slow even compared to the speed of the internet. Um, every time you wanted to move around the map, you had to refresh the entire page and load an entire new image that was like one block over from where you were looking. Um, and it was, and you couldn't pan on the map. It was always aligned to the same boundaries. And then in 2005 came Google Maps, and Google Maps kind of revolutionized everything with its beautiful interface. Um, and like. But what was actually innovative about it? Was it, it, it wasn't the interface, it, it wasn't really the red marker or the little weather widget. No, it was none of those things, it, it was the tile. So in particular, a raster tile. Raster tiles are 256 by 256 pixel PNG files that are stored on the server and then served to the browser on request when you're looking at a particular location on the map. Each tile is one piece of the map in a big grid of pieces which, as you can imagine, loads a lot faster. So if you can think of this as like the base of you know, the underlying imagery that's not interactive, but it's um, an image that shows base layers. Um, and this kind of map is kind of what they call a slippy map. Who's heard the term slippy map before? A slippy map is a map that you can pan and drag around. Um, so only the tiles in the current map view are requested and loaded instead of trying to load the entire world at that zoom level, which if you imagine, you know, on one page view, there's about 15 map tiles that are being loaded on every every section. Um, this is just San Francisco. It takes 15 tiles at this zoom to make San Francisco. Imagine how many tiles that would take for the entire world at this zoom. And then imagine if you had to load them all at the same time. That would be really, really slow. So um, modern web maps are super hella fast because we have these awesome kick-ass map tiles. Um, and raster tiles are available at preset zoom levels, and there's a different tile set at each zoom. So these are pre-generated um, zoom levels. If any of you are familiar with you know, GIS software, you kind of have an infinite scale. Like you, can, you can make your scale whatever you'd like it to be between reality and the map. Uh, I, with web maps, you have one set of preset zoom levels. Zoom level zero is one tile for the entire world. That would be zoom level zero. If you ever like go into Google Maps or whatever and zoom all the way out, you see the world repeated over and over and over and over and over again. That's one tile for the whole world. So the number of tiles in the grid is related to this function. So two to the zoom times two to the zoom. So two to the zero is one times two to the zero, which is one, which is one, is so one tile for the world. So at zoom level one, you have two to the one, which is two, times two to the one, which is two, four tiles for the world. And then it increases exponentially in powers of two from there. Um, you'll notice that the world in the view of the web map is square. Um, we already know that like taking a three-dimensional thing and putting it on a two-dimensional thing adds distortion. In order to make 
the world square, we actually don't, the web maps you see don't go all the way up to 90 degrees north and 90 degrees south. They stop at 85. Um, and this is so that the tiles can make a perfect square. And you know, computers really dig binary math. That they can do it really quickly. It makes it really um, efficient for a computer to load a square rather than any other uh, dimensional rectangle or any other shape. Um, and also, it helps for being able to locate very quickly where you are in the grid and which tiles you need to load. So this is a map projection called Web Mercator. Um, the Mercator projection uh, map is like the most common one you see, the one where Greenland is like huge and the same size as Africa. Um, and like horribly distorted and you see it in classrooms all the time and cartographers hate it. But um, web maps love it and Google made that choice in 2005 to go with Web Mercator and you can get a lot of really fun fights on the internet with like old school cartographers about how much they hate web maps because they have to look at this ugly thing all the time when there's no doubt. Um, but I digress. Um, so zoom levels two, three, four, and five are increasing exponentially. Um, and you know, like I said, this was really useful. And it was really innovative in 2005, right? Like, all of a sudden, you weren't panning massive images over and over and over again. Um, but it's also really limiting. You have 20 preset zoom levels, and you can't really get anything in between. If you're trying to get, you know, your city, and it looks too small at zoom level 8, but too, doesn't fit on the screen at zoom level 9, like, that sucks for you, and you kind of have to deal with that. Um, but more recently, the web mapping world has graduated to what we call vector tiles. And this is this open source specification. It was created by one of my crazy evil genius coworkers who like sits and just hacks on stuff all day in the middle of nowhere. And like, literally he lives in like a farm in Winthrop, Washington. And like just sits and writes code all day. It's crazy, it's awesome. I, I kinda want that way. Sounds really cool. Um, so vector tiles are a similar idea to raster tiles. You're still taking a bunch of information and tiling it. Um, but instead of creating tiled images, we're creating tiled vector data that can be then dynamically styled in the browser, which is really fascinating when you think about, like, OK, now that you have all this vector data, you have all of these options for how you can style it and render it on the page, the newest of which is um, using GL. Um, using WebGL, you, we can actually do like crazy rendering, fast, tilty, super awesome fractional zoom stuff. That's like kind of kind of blows my mind. But so when I say vector data, I'm talking about roads, parks, water bodies, bike paths, points of interest, state boundaries. All of these <coughs> exist as geographic vector data, points, lines, and polygons that have an associated coordinate pair with them. Lot two, lot two. Or if it's a line, it has a bunch of coordinate pairs in order. You can draw from one point to the next, to the next, to the next. And then a polygon is the same thing, but the first and the last point are repeated so that it makes a full shape. Um, and all of the vector data, in addition to just having a location, also has attributes attached to it. So a road might have a name. It might have a uh, speed limit. It might have the number of lanes. It might have who maintains it. All this information is packed in with the vector data. And that's really useful because you can use that information also to style the vector data. And so if you make a choice and say, you know, I do want to style my roads based on the number of lanes, you can do that. And then if you later say, I, don't, I no longer want that information or I would like to style from different information, you can do that because the vector tile is actually retaining all of that information inside of the, the data format which is, and, and um, so one data format is GeoJSON. Um, that is a geographic data format that is really common in web mapping because it's an extension of JSON, JavaScript object notation, which means it's just JavaScript, which means no translation has to happen, and it can just all happen magically. This is the stuff that I find really fascinating that most people find really boring, so I apologize for talking about it a bunch. But um, I'm gonna do it anyway, because Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so um, vector tiles, uh, they store all of this information, the vectors, the locations, and the attributes as a protocol buffer format, um, or PDF, which is a binary format, and it's super lightweight and super compact. Because you would think, OK, storing an image, cool, versus storing a bunch of vector information. Like, you'd think the vector information is going to be bigger, because it has a lot more data associated with it. But no, it's not, because of this awesome, sweet format that makes it really compact and lightweight. Um, and so then vector tiles load really quickly, and then you have all these dynamic styling options with it. 
So this is like the future. Um, yes? How exactly do they like break the vector maps into tiles? Uh, the question was how exactly do they break the vector maps into tiles? Um, one tool that um, we have at Mapbox is called Mapbox Studio. And it is a desktop application that has two purposes. One is to design tiles for vector uh, tiles. But the other one is actually to take this data. And what it does is it, um, just like we have, you know, you have the preset zoom levels for um, raster tiles, vector tiles also have preset zoom levels. So what it does is it takes the vector data and it makes the same grid with, you know, Zoom level zero is one tile for the world, but instead of putting it all in all, the whole image on one tile, it passed all that vector data into one tile for the world. So it's geolocated, right? So it's the same kind of tile boundaries as you would have in uh, with raster tiles, but then it, it does it with vector tiles as well, and it actually gets really um, annoying if you have like really dense vector data and you're trying to show a lot of dense or store a lot of dense data all over the world because then those those tiles actually get very heavy. I don't know if that answered your question like completely because you have to kind of see it. Okay. And like the problem too is that like vector tiles you can't like we try to visualize them but it's like binary data. It's hard to like conceptualize. I'd be happy to talk more about it too in a time where I can right. think more clearly about it um, and that better way to explain it. But I appreciate that question. It's a great question. Um, so vector tiles are one of the super awesome open source components of web maps, and they're actually like the foundation, right? Like we put these tiles on a map, all of a sudden that's what we think of when we think of a map, is that something with like information on it that we can see that is visual and geographic. Um, Mapbox.js is what makes it possible for us to add tiles to our map container. Um, so if we go back to our example here, um, we have these map tiles that are sitting underneath uh, this this data, the routes data, right? It's got parks, it's got labels, it's got roads, and actually, interestingly, it has these green bike lanes, which is really helpful and useful if you're, you know, using a bike app. Yes. So these tiles are separate, like you might have a layer or a set of road tiles, a set of park tiles, you of can. Bike route tiles. You can. Um, the nice thing about vector tiles is that you can take a bunch of vector data and then make one tile set that includes all the vector data. So you can make like a road tile and a parks tile, or you can style all of that information together into one style that includes multiple layers of vector data. It's a little bit it's a little bit confusing. But um, the way so the data layers that are making up these tiles, um, it's actually a curated vector data set uh, that Mapbox created. It's a combination of OpenStreetMap data and natural earth data. We call it Mapbox Streets. Um, and it, it basically contains all of the data in OpenStreetMap plus some vector terrain from natural earth. And in Mapbox Studio, if you use the program, it comes preloaded with all of that data. So you don't have to worry about adding it. You can just go ahead and style it right away, um, which is super convenient if you want to just like make a map because then all the data is right there and you don't have to worry about data wrangling, which is like, what is the statistic everyone throws around? Like data problems are 80% of work spent programming or something, like data munging and trying to conform things. So if you don't have to worry about that, it makes it really helpful and useful and awesome. Um, so yes, these tiles were made with the Mapbox Streets data set, and you can see it has bike lanes in it too, in addition to like the things that you might normally quote unquote expect to see roads, parks, that kind of thing, water bodies. Um, and um, yeah, so I think I maybe already answered the question, but these map tiles came from, um, was it where these map tiles come from? They seem to be highlighting bike routes, this is true. And it highlights capital bike share stations as well on that map, so they're like little um, green dots here. But um, these are actually not part of the underlying tile set, they are uh, overlaid data, which we'll see in a second, because we actually interact with them. Um, as opposed to the um, underlying tiles, which we don't interact with. Um, while they are created from vector data with a style applied, by the time they're in your browser, they're rendered as images. So they're not interactive. Um, yeah, not interactive, or interactive and not part of the underlying style. And also, I think they're quite aesthetically pleasing. Like, they're, you know, really pretty. Making pretty maps is really hard. It's really easy to make super ugly maps. Um, way easier than it should be, honestly. Um, 
So, and these tiles were created with our desktop design tool, Mapbox Studio. Um, this is what Studio looks like. Um, Studio has a bunch of data, like I said, that comes preloaded with it. And then using a styling language called Cardo CSS, you can then pick out individual layers, like I want all of my streets to be gray, and I want them to have line width four pixels. And then you also can do conditional styling at different zoom levels. So you might not want to show every road label when you're zoomed way out at zoom level one because then literally your entire map would just be road labels. Um, and Studio has some like built-in stuff in there to like make sure you don't do things like that. Like it, they, it won't show, this one, it won't show water features above zoom level or below zoom level 12 or something because it, they know that it would just like totally overwhelm your map. You can override it too if you want to be daring with your cartography. Um, so yes, using a styling language called Cardo CSS, uh, you can style any vector data you wish. I said it comes preloaded with, with three Mapbox curated data sets. One of them is that Mapbox Streets that includes the um, OpenStreetMap data. There's uh, Mapbox Terrain, which is a bunch of vector terrain data. Think like contour lines and grades and polygons that represent different grades and elevations, which is really useful, which we'll see in a sec. And, um, the third data set is actually a raster data set of imagery, um, which, uh, just to go on a tangent for a second, the Mapbox satellite team is like totally crazy awesome. One of the projects that they work on is called the Cloudless Atlas. Literally what they're doing is ingesting imagery at all these different zoom levels that we predetermined, and they build algorithms that go through it pixel by pixel determine whether that pixel is a cloud, like from the cloud imagery, and then replace that pixel with the same location in another imagery set, and then do color correction on the whole thing. Wow. So we have a cloudless imagery set of the entire world at a bunch of different zoom levels. I think down to like 17 or something, which is like pretty close. To, it's kind of crazy. And like imagery also it just has this really weird relationship with the US government, where like various different government agencies manage different imagery data sets. So it's like it's like deliberately spread out. One of them is like agriculture, and then like NASA has does the Landsat data, and it's kind of all over the place. And then for the really high zoom levels, we buy imagery from a Digital Globe, who are mostly a government defense contractor, but also do nice things like give out free new imagery when there's natural disasters, um, like in Nepal. They provided a bunch of free imagery for people to trace and put into OpenStreetMap, which is really cool. But that was a massive digression. I'm gonna pause for a second. Do you have any questions so far? Yes, okay, yeah. Okay, so this is kind of referring on to the last thing that you were discussing, and my question is, what about um, citizen data sets? Like if people have their drones, and they say, I'm gonna find my drone, and I'm gonna gather this map data, and it's a really high, is it like higher zoom level than like Google to the right? I'm wondering about you know, privacy issues and also integrating this Totally. Um, if you own data, I mean, I don't know intimately the like legal ramifications around collecting imagery from drones, um, and definitely don't speak for Mapbox in that. Just cover my for myself. Um, but um, if you own data, like on the whole, if you own data or your agency owns data, um, you can add whatever kind of data you would like to your map using these tools. They're all free, open source, um, and you can put whatever, whether it be vector data or raster imagery data, you can include that in inside of, um, with these tools. Um, in terms of like the privacy and legal stuff, I will, I can like totally ask my coworkers who like really know, and like we can, I'll give you my card, well, we'll make sure that I find the answer to that, but I don't know, sorry. Do you have a question? So when I open the raster data set, how far can you go with just the, the vector data? Uh, yeah, mostly. I okay. mean, so OpenStreetMap, um, I was going to talk about it a little bit, but OpenStreetMap is this um, totally interactive, hands on, user contributed, open source world geographic data set. Uh, it's like Wikipedia, but a giant map of the world, and anyone can edit it. Um, and a lot of people edit it. Bing actually provides imagery to OpenStreetMap for free. Um, so you, anyone can go to osm.org and start tracing things. So a lot of it does originally come from imagery um, or from, um, in the case of like a city's parcel data set or tax lots, 
they probably had like an old flat map that they like scanned and geo-referenced and someone traced. Um, and that's sort of where the geographic data comes from. Um, but the world's changing all the time. So, um, you know, not even just natural disasters, but like buildings going up and coming down and construction and road changes. And so, um, I know, I agree. It's like, <laughs> it's, a little, it's a little intense, but um, I wouldn't say we're beyond imagery, per se. Uh, one second. Over that first, yeah. Uh, so you, sorry, you said the the Mapbox curated data sets are those just like available for our use, no matter what we want to do with them? Yep. Okay, and it's the the Open Street Map Street data, and what else? Um, Natural Earth, which is okay. a data set that was created by uh, Nathaniel Kelso, formerly of Stamen and Apple, now it's a company called Mapzen and uh, Tom Patterson from the National <coughs> Park Service. So it's this like old school cartographer and this new school cartographer, and they work together to put out these like amazing data sets with political and cultural and physical features and like beautiful hill shades and like, oh, it's gorgeous. Um, so we use some of that data as well. And it creates interesting attribution issues because OpenStreetMap uses the open database license, which is very like, it's, you know, sure, like it's, it's very restrictive and it has, um, we have certain agreements with OpenStreetMap when people use our data. And, and anytime you see a Mapbox map in the bottom right corner, it'll say, you know, copyright OpenStreetMap, and it'll also have a link that says improve this map. And that's part of our agreement with them that we will be constantly asking our users to like help improve the map. But yeah, those data sets are totally free to use within the uh, like terms of service attribution requirements. Yeah. So like overall, the data for like mapping the world, how big is that in terms of storage? Um, compressed, it's like 35 gigs right now. Something. Yeah, and that's like, yeah, it's actually, it's not, it's not bad. It's stored in like a weird XML format, so it's like super compact, and it's all like, I'm gonna talk about this minute, it was like strangely tag-based and difficult in its own way. But it's comprehensive and cool, it's like, it's neat. My question, uh, two extra questions, one question about, um, so is Mapbox Studio open source? Mapbox GL, or Mapbox JS. Mapbox Studio? Mapbox Studio, uh, yes. It is open source, okay. Yes. Are there other libraries that I can use, like from a, like I'm, I'm working on, but what can I find, like libraries that can manipulate these, uh, like protocol buffers and so forth? Totally, um, so the, like the, um, the vector tile spec and standard all open source on GitHub. And we actually build our rendering on top of an open source tool called Mapnik. Um, and Mapnik does tile rendering as well. Um, if you go to the, we have like 500 public repos or something. Yeah. So if you go to GitHub and um, github.com slash mapbox um, and do a quick search, we have a lot of uh, weird, not weird, kind of awesome like bindings to the different languages depending okay. on where you're trying to work. So if you're not like a C++ hacker, it's cool. Like we have like node bindings for Mapnik and um, data transformation stuff, which is really neat. Um, I'm going to keep going and then we'll pause again a little bit for more questions. Um, so going back to Mapbox Studio, um, you can um, take this vector data, um, whether it be the Mapbox streets and terrain that comes preloaded, or you can add your own source data if you want to include that additionally in the style. Then, you know, after you style this data, you can upload the style to your Mapbox account and use it in Mapbox.js. Um, and Mapbox accounts are free, up to a certain number of map views, it's like 50,000 map views, which is like kind of a lot of map views, so but you can kind of go a long way on the free plan. Um, but I actually kind of quite like that as a funding model, that like you use more server hosting space and then you pay more, it seems like it makes sense to me. More map views, anyway. Um, so um, in the example that we have here with the with the capital bike share, um, this is what the code looks like when you're actually initializing the map with Mapbox.js. So what uh, we have here is a map constructor, and it is you know it's the thing that is a container. It knows what tiles are. It knows what panning and zooming is. It it has all of these like features and capabilities, and the second. Um, argument here is actually um, an ID of that style that was created in Mapbox Studio. Um, and then, um, you know, you have all these options of like, do I want to be able to let people zoom both with scrolling and like, what do I want the maximum and minimum zoom levels to be and where do I want it to initialize in the world and what zoom level do I want it to initialize. 
So, um, so when the map container on your page makes a request to, to get the map tiles to put in the container, the custom style is being applied to the vector data and then rendered images and then placed in the container. Magic. And this is like the magic of, I think, the, you know, there's always that question of like, you're a company, but you make open source tools. How did you notice the magic? What do you do? I don't understand. Um, and I think it's like the server configuration around like taking this like these protocol buffers, vector data, applying the style, and rendering them quickly, dynamically. Uh, I would say that that's where the magic is for the special sauce or whatever you want to call it. Fairy dust. So um, this is a container, a map container that literally just has these tiles in it. It doesn't have the bike share, it doesn't have any of the routing on it. It's just the tiles that my coworker Duncan made with the roads and bike routes. Um, so you know that those tiles can be used not only in this one application, but anywhere where you can put the tiles in an app container. It's pretty cool. Um, boom, tiles, map, whoa, crazy, awesome. Um, so we have now established over a lengthy period of time that um, this example has tiles in it. But what else does this example do? Uh, well, we have two markers that we can move around. We have our, our origin and our destination points. So I can you know, say, I actually am not over here. I am, <coughs> oh, sorry, I phrase. Um, I am down here, and I want to go over here. So these are Drabble markers. Seems kind of simple, but like that's another component of this map. So here, we're making a custom little icon style guy. It's got a, let's see, little person on it. Hi, little person. And uh, then uh, we make a new marker, put it at the location, put it on map. We're actually we're not even putting on map here, we're just making the object marker. So in the code, we create a marker icon, which is icon constructor, and then add it to a marker object, and then eventually we add the marker object to the map. Um, but the thing I'm trying to get at here is that like there's all these tiny little pieces in here that are working together, and this is just one of them. And um, you know, not to like spoil the moral of the story, but like you know, you're taking all these little component parts and putting them together. And so, and there are a lot more components I think than we all realize when we look at a map. Um, so, in this code, right, we have like marker color and marker marker symbol, and the way that the um, library knows what marker symbol pitch means and marker size large is that it's using a styling specification um, called Simple Style, also open source, um, that is what we use to create our um, markers and our like default styles for lines and polygons. Um, Maki is also an open source library that Mapbox created, and it's a bunch of little icons that you can add to um, either like your base map or to your markers. So both of these are open source too. You're seeing a pattern yet? Um, <laughs> ha, whoa, pause, are you noticing a pattern? The whole process is made up of tiny self-contained components, many of them open source, that work together to build these seemingly simple mapping applications. I like totally said this, did not even realize this was next on the slides. Anyway. <laughs> um, so in addition to creating the style for the marker, we also give it a location to draw itself. And we tell it, so we tell it like, "Yo, you're gonna be draggable," and then it's like, "All right." Um, <laughs> so this allows us to change the starting point of our trip. And then we create a second marker that has a different style, where it's also draggable for our destination. End marker, call it. And this time, instead of creating an icon in a separate object, we created it right there in the options because people are inconsistent when they write JavaScript. They sometimes do things one way and sometimes do them another. And especially if they're like, you know what, I'm just making this for the blog. I mean, this code isn't even going to be public, except for now. So, um, haha, <laughs> Duncan. <laughs> right? <laughs> he's, he's living the dream, huh? Cool. Um, so, here we're creating um, a marker. And the, it, one interesting thing here, too, is that you see that the first argument is an actual lat long object. And I'm going to get into this in a minute. I think I have like 10 slides about how annoying lat longs are. But just notice that that's an object. It's not just an array of coordinates. It's an object. 
fascinating. Um, so then we have both of those markers to map. Literally, start marker, add to map, end marker, add to map. They are now added to the map. And then like we have a map with tiles and two drag ball markers. Um, so that's cool, right? Tiles, markers, but what else is this doing? It's doing way more than just having markers you can drag around. Although that would be pretty fun, I guess. That's it. It wouldn't do anything, but just... Anyway, um, so what else is happening here? What happens when we drag a marker? What is it doing? It looks like it's finding the closest bike share station. And routing. Oh, and routing. Well, I guess I, was taught, I wrote about routing first anyway, so good on you. So when we move the markers, there are some directions that appear on the map. There are walking directions from the marker itself to the nearest capital bike share station. Um, and then there are cycling directions between those stations that we <coughs> identified. So that's actually four separate things that this map is doing. Remember when I said maps are hard, right? It gets confusing. The first thing it's doing actually is just straight up adding the bike share stations to the map. Um, we hadn't done that yet. So that's the first thing it's doing. Second is it's locating the nearest station to each marker. It's generating walking directions between the markers and the stations. And it's generating bike directions between those stations. So that's four different tasks that this map is doing, in addition to all the ones that it's already doing, like adding tiles and we added the markers. So the bike share stations are housed in a GeoJSON file. As we mentioned before, GeoJSON is an extension of JSON, which stands for JavaScript Object Notation. And it's a series of key value pairs um, the idea of the specification is that it's a very specific set of key value pairs to represent geographic data that web mapping libraries really like. Um, Mapbox.js is um, written on top of a very popular web mapping library called Leaflet. Who here has heard of Leaflet before? From you. Oh, well, <laughs> I have. Here's where Leaflet got from me. Um, so Leaflet um, was created by a gentleman named Vlad who lives in Kiev. Um, it's a colleague of mine. And it was a response to OpenLayers.js, which is another open source web mapping library. It was super bulky. And he was working at a company called CloudMade, and his boss asked him, like, can you like take OpenLayers and like make it faster and better? And so he started tearing apart OpenLayers, and he decided, screw it, I'm just going to write my own. And it's going to be way better and more awesome. And he wasn't really a developer either. But he like built this like crazy thing just because he needed to. It's like a testament to like, yes, you are a programmer, damn it. You write codes. They work sometimes. That makes you a programmer. <laughs> uh, but uh, so he called Leaflet because it was so much more lightweight than any of the other libraries out there. That's why it's called Leaflet. Ooh, I probably should have gotten more sleep. Um, <laughs> so because GeoJSON is just JavaScript, it can easily be used in web maps, which is super awesome and cool. Saw this lovely slide before. This is from a GeoJSON data set of map time chapters. We'll talk about map time at the end. Um, but GeoJSON, series of key value pairs with very specific pieces. Um, so things like a geometry object that says what type of feature it is and what coordinates um, are part of it. As yeah, so it's it's specific and that's really helpful. Um, so the example that in our little bike share example, it's using a library called jQuery to load the GeoJSON asynchronously and then add the points with marker objects. And um, hard part, this is kind of fun because I'm talking to people who, for the most part, are like somewhat technical. Um, the way harder way to teach this is to talk to people who know a lot about maps and don't know a ton about programming because async is like stupid hard to conceptualize and think about like, so I'm asking it to do something, but I'm not waiting for it to be done. I'm just going to go and do another thing, and then when it's done, it's going to do another thing. It's really confusing to follow and frustrating. Um, but like, if you learn JavaScript through making maps, then you like have like a very tough education very quickly in like the weird ways of the internet and JavaScript and strangeness. So yay, async. It's great. Um, so what, uh, what this example is doing is it's saying, all right, I'm going to asynchronously grab this GeoJSON file. When I have it, I'm going to check to make sure it's JSON. Oh, cool. Then I am going to make a little icon called inactive station. 
um, that is, you know, a little, little circle, little green circle. And then for each feature in that GeoJSON object, which is an array of features, add it to the map with that style that I defined. So that's going through the file one by one, each location, and adding it to the map of the map. Now, I'm going to digress again, but this one's planned. Uh, so this is one of the many silly nuances of web mapping. So if you look back, we're going to show this code again. Look at what's going on with the latitude and longitude here at the end. So what it's doing is it's actually taking the GeoJSON and flipping the coordinates. And it's saying, all right, GeoJSON, your coordinates are backwards for a lot marker. A lot marker wants them in the other <laughs> order. There is much disagreement in the web mapping world about whether or all the world about whether coordinates should be written in lat long or long lat. And then you have like the math mathematicians who are like, uh, if you think about it like a Cartesian plane, it should be long lat because the x is you know. People get really heated about it. It's really dumb. So GeoJSON <laughs> prefers longitude latitude, but Leaflet and Mapbox.js, which is an extension of Leaflet, prefer lat long. Um, and so in part of Mapbox.js, and it's, the reason it exists is to make it easy for Leaflet to interact with Mapbox's infrastructure. But in doing that, we've created a bunch of methods and, and objects and constructors that extend Leaflet to make things like this less annoying. Also things like loading in files externally. Like we have a bunch of functions that have built in Ajax. Because these things are like unnecessarily confusing. And you shouldn't have to shouldn't have to worry about whether it's lat long or long lat. And I guarantee if you try to go and make a web map, at least once in your life, you're going to end up with like, why are my coordinates in Saudi Arabia? They're supposed to be in Serbia. Mm -hmm. Don't understand. And it's you'd probably this issue. Those actually are those. It's about the only example I know off the top of my head where the two flipped are those locations. So yeah, this is annoying. But anyway, that's just so again, we look at the puppy to make ourselves feel better about the annoying lack of standards in open source. And uh, move forward. So once the bike share locations are added to the map, we have to locate the nearest one to our origin and our destination. To do this, we're using another awesome open source library called TERF.js. TERF is one of my favorite things in the world um, because I like JavaScript and I like spatial analysis, and I wrote the documentation, so I know it really well. Um, but um, so what TERF does is it takes a bunch of really old spatial analysis operations, which is just like straight up geometry, right? Like what is the closest thing from here to here? And how many of these things are inside of this other thing? And what area are they intersecting? So these, what are these two areas? What's their intersection? What's the area of that? Things like that. Um, so the spatial analysis library, spatial analysis is used to describe relationships between geographic data. Um, it's like the most concise definition I could think of, other than just like giving examples. Like, where is my nearest coffee shop? Yeah. Um, this example uses a particular turf function called nearest, which literally finds the nearest thing. Um, so it seems trivial. But if we think back to the fact that the world is this like three-dimensional, lumpy, oblate spheroid thing that has, um, you know, a reality, like the curvature of the Earth adds like real distance as compared to like a Cartesian plane when you are in like, a flat thing. So when you are taking this round, lumpy thing and putting it into like a flat thing, you have to distort it. It's like peeling an orange and trying to lay it flat. You can't do that. So you have to distort it in some way. One of the ways that um, Mercator distorts is that it actually stretches land masses near the poles, which means it is not, it, the only thing it has fidelity of is direction. Other than that, it like areas are wrong, distances are wrong. So you can't just measure like a pixel distance and then translate that to a real world distance. Um, you have to um, actually understand how the world is being stretched in that particular area. Fortunately, there's a bunch of very smart people who have done this map for us. And like we do in as programmers, we just steal other people's work and then use it and then build other things from it. So TURF was a project 
to take some of these really old spatial analysis operations, which are basically like big old geometry functions, and rewrite them in JavaScript. Even though like every spatial analysis library, like there's one called Shapely, and there's one called GDAL, and Ogre to Ogre, and Grass, and all of these different tools, they're still taking these same old Fortran functions and <laughs> like building bindings for other languages. What this project did was actually he busted out the geometry textbooks and rewrote the functions in JavaScript, which makes them fast and efficient. Um, but also it took them a long time. But um, Turf, uh, the whole code for it is on GitHub and it's fun to go and look at if you're a math nerd or a node nerd or a math node nerd. Um, so this example uses the nearest function to find the nearest station to the markers. Um, and this operation is happening dynamically in the browser, not making a round trip to a server, straight up on the client side every time the markers are dragged. And it's super fast. Um, super hell fast, indeed. Um, <laughs> So, you know, playing around with it, like, it found, it, it's finding, like, as I'm moving this marker, before I even drop it, it's finding the nearest thing. So it's really fast and really efficient and awesome and useful for a wide variety of function cases. Uh, what's the maximum number of things I can search through? Um, super dependent on your browser and the data and what else is going on in your code. So we benched it for a variety of things that really depend on your use case. Um, if you go to the Mapbox blog, there's a ton of blog posts about like, the one called How Fast is Turf, um, that will have like more concretely. Okay. Yeah. Um, is there, I guess there's, I've really had thought about this. Is, when you were dragging it around and finding the nearest station, is it just direct nearest, or is it nearest in the direction you're trying to head? Like, is, it, is there a way to tell it to be smart enough not to backtrack and only go like, Forward. I, I totally understand. Uh, yeah. I think I don't know that you could do that explicitly with this particular function um, because, like, how do you define forward? You know, right. like that one becomes tricky. Um, but I bet you could probably like string a combo of things together to make that happen. But not with your straight up. Um, is the time there? Is that real time data? Like like traffic data? Uh, no, this is based on um, the distance average biking speed as defined by <coughs> the algorithm, mm -hmm. the routing algorithm. Um, and um, probably, I mean, if it was driving directions, it probably would have like road speed limit. Um, could you change that? Could you make an app for like slow light riders? Dude, yeah. I'm totally getting there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm reading my mind. Um, so, see, that leaves our last little open source component of all of this, which is the Mapbox Directions API. Um, and when we are finding the location of the capital bike share station, the latitude and longitude of that location, and the latitude and longitude of the other location that we're, is our destination, are being passed to the Directions API, and what is returned is a route. Um, uh, routing is kind of complicated to implement, but um, conceptually it's actually quite straightforward. Um, every path or you know road or trail or whatever has a bunch of attributes associated with it, like we were talking about before. Um, maybe like speed limit or grade or whether or not it has bike lanes or how long it is or whether or not it has sidewalks. You know, these are all attributes of these lines. And each of them has a cost associated with it when you think about routing. Right? So the role of the routing algorithm is to find the lowest cost path between point A and point B. And the cost associated may not necessarily be distance, right? So if you are a slow bike rider, or we built a routing algorithm for Scoot in San Francisco, which is like rental scooters, San Francisco has a lot of hills. Those scooters can't go up big grades. So we had to make the paths that were very steep, very costly, such that the lowest cost path would route around those grades. Um, so yeah, so costs are, so are assigned based on the goal of the routing. Um, and not just shortest distance, but faster roads, and for walking, maybe roads with sidewalks are less costly. And um, you know, you asked about traffic. Um, right now, the way that our routing algorithm works is it's built, also built on top of OpenStreetMap data um, uh, called the open source routing machine. I think I might have my next slide. So yeah, where do these attributes come from? It's built on, uh, on top of OSRM. Open Source Routing Machine, which is an open source project that's built on top of OpenStreetMap data. The next version of OSRM uh, will be will allow 
once it's released, will allow you to include third-party data, like traffic, um, as part of your algorithm. Currently, the um, algorithm only takes into account um, open tree map data. But literally this morning when I woke up, I had an email that was like, you've been subscribed to a new repo on GitHub, and it was like OSRM traffic prototype. So, um, soon. <laughs> um, and like my dream someday is to create a well-lit paths algorithm um, by like taking street light data and like combining that with paths and so like safety routing but not in a racist way. Yeah? Uh, there's, because a lot of this is built on OpenStreetMap and the, um, that's mostly like user contributed a lot of the path tracing, but that what you were talking about right there, can you annotate things like this road has good lighting in OpenStreetMap or does that does OpenStreetMap not support that yet? So OpenStreetMap um, is based on, I think I get to this, but OpenStreetMap is based on tags. So a, a tag in OpenStreetMap can mean like a lot of different things. And there isn't like, there's like best practices, but they're not, it's just a big old XML database. So you could really do whatever you want. So if you are trying to find swimming pools in OpenStreetMap, for example, a personal passion project of mine, um, you can like search for tags for swimming pool equals yes or leisure equals swimming pool, or area equals swimming pool, or building equals swimming pool, and there's like a ton of tags, um, and all of, you know, there's popular and not popular ones. So I'm sure there has been a proposal, in the, and I'm sure it's in the wiki for like well-lit, um, but if, like with third-party data, it's a lot, you can be more authoritative, especially if you get it, if you're lucky and you get data from like utility companies, and they happen to provide, you know, something awesome. Um, then uh, you'd be a little more authoritative. But then that gets into like the nuances of like how authoritative is OpenStreetMap, and um, the answer then is always like depends on where you're looking. Massachusetts, great data, seriously. Um, Ohio too. Yeah. So is the routing happening in the browser, or is that an API call? It's an API call. Okay. Yeah. How fast? The API call. <laughs> how big like is not, yeah, so I, I'm not entirely sure, but again, I bet that's something that we benched and like, if you were to look at the um, repo, I'm sure it would, you could figure it out, or I could ask. Yeah. Figure it out. Yeah. Um, just, just a quick question about the code you were showing. Sure. Like, particularly the coordinates for the uh, start marker and the end marker. Uh -huh. I noticed that looked a lot like HTML5 Canvas. Yes. So, I'm going to get there in a second because this map is special in a way that we haven't seen yet. Okay. Dot, dot, dot. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, OpenStreetMap, crowdsourced map of the world, huge data set full of interesting things. Uh, this is what it looks like when you go to osm.org. Um, it is not the prettiest tile set in the world, but um, this is, you know, so a, a choice. This is Burlingame, California. Um, and this was a choice to render these tiles in this particular style, but because OpenStreetMap is a data set, you can choose to render whatever pieces you want to render. Um, this, uh, this, these tiles render specific attributes, specific tags, basically. Um, and it's really pretty, I think, but also not pretty at the same time. Um, uh, and like, it's a pretty comprehensive resource of road data. Um, back in sometime, somewhat recently, and also again in the future, people do big imports of the Tiger data set, which is the road data set for the entire US. Uh, if you've ever worked with that data, you know it's not awesome. Um, a lot of it's wrong, and a lot of it is offset, and maybe too detailed or not detailed enough, or has weird kinks in it, and so they're big projects related to like, editing data, um, like editing Tiger data. You can like specifically go and find data that was imported from Tiger and then go and edit it with tools like Map Roulette, which is a fun little game where it'll show you a random location and be like, there's a problem here, fix it. And then like keep score and stuff. Great way to kill time. Um, so um, OpenStreetMap features are defined by tags, I'm saying. Um, and this is, I just did a quick search for the most popular tag on OpenStreetMap, which is building. Um, building equals yes. That is like the like <laughs> number one tag. <laughs> building equals yes. But that's 84.19% of the values for the key building. But 8.15% uh, is building equals house. 
for a building equals residential. This 2.28. Building equals garage. And it goes on and on and on. Um, uh, thinking about the number of features and the size of the data set, 84% um, of the buildings is 129 million. 364,022 features. That's a lot, a lot. It's just a big data set, and especially um, with projects like Map Roulette and the Humanitarian Open Street Map team, which seeks to like build maps um, in post-disaster areas, constantly adding to this data set all the time. After Nepal, there were like two million mappers mapping actively, which is like, Nuts. It's like the biggest activation of people to do mapping after disaster um, ever. So it's pretty cool. Um, so yeah, the directions API routing algorithms are assigned costs to each open street map tag to determine the least cost paths, which is how you end up with things like bike directions. You know, you don't necessarily want to route a bike on a super busy street that doesn't have a bike lane. That's going to be more costly. Um, so if we look at everything we've talked about so far, these are all, like, this is like overview, open source projects that we've talked about. We have Mapbox.js, Turf.js, OSRM, Vector Tiles, GeoJSON. I even include Maki and the simple style spec. Like, there's a ton of little open source pieces. And that's, that's it. That's all, these things, that's all this map can do, right? Nope. There's one more fancy special thing that this map can do. In this top left here, we have this button that says View Elevation Profile. If I click on it, ah, it actually is showing. So, so you see why you know HTML5 Canvas that's what's doing the tilting and the rotating. Um, and this we recently released a um, native uh, GL um, for mobile, and so you can do the same kind of tilt, shift, zoom stuff with GL. But this demo was created before that, and I don't necessarily feel like I can speak about GL with authority especially JavaScript EGL. My coworker called it feature script. It's like a little <laughs> bit over my head as a somewhat junior developer, but um, this I can talk about. So this is awesome. As we kind of go along here on this route, you can see it tells you the elevation, but also the percent grade as you go from point to point. And you can like shift it or move it around. It's really cool. Super neat. So that's like, oh yeah. Is this meant to is this what? Is this national all the elevation data set? What's that? Huh? Um, so it's like, <laughs> like what? Crazy. Awesome. I love this gift. This guy should be in every slide deck. Um, so what, what's going on here? How, how is this working? Um, this is the Mapbox Surface API. Um, and it, the, its entire goal is to inspect vector data. Uh, so the idea being you can have a bunch of vector data and then you can hit the API and say, tell me what's going on attribute wise at this location of this data and then it returns that value. So I mentioned, oh, so in this example, what the code is doing is it's hitting the directions API at like preset um, distances along the line. I, mean, I don't remember what the distance is exactly, like how many feet along. Um, but we, uh, we hit the API along an array of points that are on the route. And then what we're actually requesting the data from is the vector terrain data set. It's one of the three data sets that comes preloaded with Mapbox Studio and also that exists in the ecosystem. Uh, it's called Mapbox Terrain and it's created from uh, the natural earth data set that I mentioned before. Um, but it's also sort of combined with so there's some elevation data in OpenStreetMap as well. So um, when I say Mapbox curated, I have coworkers who sit and meticulously go through this stuff and like figure out what each version of the data set is going to look like. We're at terrain V2 right now, I think. And V3 is going to come out soon, and streets V6 is going to come out soon. So like, because that data is being updated all the time in OpenStreetMap world, and we, as we are, and the data actually, the vector data set, that pulls from OpenStreetMap is being regenerated every five minutes. So it's constantly bringing in new changes to OpenStreetMap, but in the new versions of these data sets, we're adding maybe additional points of interest that we didn't include before. You know, like we don't include everything that's in OpenStreetMap, it's curated. So as time goes on and we feel out from our users, like what are your needs? Like what kind of data do you want to be styling? Then we can update those data sets and provide more data and information. Um, 
So the surface API is returning elevation data from the Mapbox terrain data set, and then the percent grade along the route is calculated and displayed on the map um, with fancy, awesome HTML5 Canvas stuff that you can read in code, but I don't really know enough about to talk about. I'm just going to be really real about that. But like, it's kind of magic to me. So no more surprises. That's the whole map. That's everything that map can do. Um, Go back. Wait, I have it up again. We should go back and look at it for a second. It's pretty. Also that guy. So, no, go back. <laughs> um, so I can go back and say edit route. Maybe we make a new route from over here to like, let's go for somewhere interesting. So like, heights, and then I can do the elevation profile, and then, you know, super awesome. Crazy. I like when they go over rivers and stuff. And they just go like, way down and up. And the question is, right, is there a bridge there? And maybe the bridge elevation isn't being accounted for in this data. Yeah. So maybe it's not totally 100% accurate. Mm -hmm. The world may never know. Unless if you were to go and look at the data set, and you could probably know. <laughs> um, so yeah, this is pretty neat. I, I, I love this project. Um, I think that it's a really cool um, <laughs> demonstration of a lot of these different component pieces and how they fit together. Um, so concisely, what are all the things that this is doing? Just to recap. Um, it's displaying vector tiles that show off bike routes. That was the first thing we talked about, was these tiles in this container. It's panning and zooming. Just feels standard, but has, you know, that's part of what Mapbox.js is providing for us. It shows capital bike share stations. It has draggable markers for origin and destination. It finds the closest bike share station to both those origin and destination points. It shows walking directions to and from the bike share stations. And it shows a bike route between those stations as well. Oh, and it shows elevation and percent grade change along the bike route with fancy, delicious graphics. And so that's like a lot of different things that are packed into this little, oh, this little map. I mean, when you saw that at first, when I was just first playing with it, like, did you think that there were going to be that many little pieces in it that we're putting it all together? Like, and, uh, my, one, of my, one of my favorite things to tell people to kind of close their mind is like, if you type in an address and you get a route to another address, provide a route for you. Like, in addition to just providing a route, it's also taking that address and turning it into a latitude and longitude point. It's called geolocating. So it's two things that it's doing. It's geolocating and then it's creating a route. And then if you start to think about these like tiny processes and how they're being stitched together super fast, so fast you don't even think about them, so fast and so easy that people email me and say, I'm not a developer, but I want to add a map to my website. Um, like that's pretty cool. Like the, the level that we have achieved of innovation and like awesome open source tools is like, is insane. And mapping is really interesting too, just because like a lot of people come into mapping from like an academic sphere and um, they're not necessarily developers, they're not necessarily technical in the same way that we might consider someone to be technical as like a programmer, but they do have this technical knowledge in terms of like map projections and we call geodesy, which is measuring the earth, or um, spatial analysis, they know what kind of spatial analysis operation it takes. And so there's all these different layers of technical knowledge, let alone making maps pretty and intuitive and easy to use and you're making a tsunami evacuation map, you better not have red and green on it because what if someone's colorblind and they don't know which way to go? Like, those are all considerations that you have to think about when making a map. And so it's just sort of mind blowing that we've reached the level that like we can just put these pieces together and like it works. I can't imagine what it must have been like even, you know, 50 years ago to like, or 100 years ago, hand typesetting and drawing that, that sounds miserable. Mm -hmm. um, I would not be in this field then. Um, so that's just kind of scratching that one example, just sort of scratches the surface about of what open source mapping tools can do. Um, and everything from the static map APIs on one end, which literally is returning an image of a map, all the way to like crazy awesome native GL, it's all new and changing all the time. And spatial problems are everywhere, like all around us, everywhere. Um, and more elegant open source tools, the more elegant open source tools we have to work on them, the better. Um, and so now we definitely have time, like 40 minutes. I did not expect to go through this quickly. Um, so in this next, well, first of all, 
questions up to now? Yes. Uh, you were talking about calculating the cost. Does it uh, go separately for the biking and then for walking, or does it take it into account? Because very often it's like especially not for biking, but for uh, climate, it makes more sense to jump out to steps before, not to go three minutes like this, even though that's just two minutes walking, but also have lights. And like I actually calculated, it, said it took me nine minutes to walk from this um, uh, what's it, uh, stop and 11 from the other one. Interesting. But, yeah. So the question was um, with routing algorithms, um, is does it take into account just biking or just like one cost model, or does it have multiple cost models associated with it, depending on like a, like a multimodal, right? So kind of what you're talking about, multimodal. Yeah, like it combines the difference of the edges between the costs. Sure. Um, right now, the we have three version like endpoints of that API. There's walking, biking, and driving. Um, and those are like specific sets of algorithms. And the open source routing machine, um, the way that it works is you set these costs based on tags, and then you kind of have to let it process through the entire data set uncompressed. So it takes a long time to like build and host a whole new version of the world. Um, but you could theoretically build in whatever you wanted. I don't know about the nuances of our specific APIs about like whether they take into account, like I know that they're not multimodal right now. Um, another project that um, is similar to the open source routing machine, or built on OSRM, but does do multimodal routing is called um, Open Trip Planner. And the TriMet website actually uses Open Trip Planner because TriMet is awesome and their entire maps are built on OpenStreetMap data. Um, and so they, for a long time, they had interns literally whose job was to like bike around Portland and edit OpenStreetMap and make sure it was accurate with all the bus stops and the lines and all of that. Um, and so Open Trip Planner does do the multimodal routing. Yeah. Um, I wondered if you had any tips for dealing with data sets that aren't in these libraries. For example, every day there's like air quality, short sure. pollen, or things that are on like the government websites but that aren't formatted already for totally. So um, the bike share stations, um, we, you know, those were in a GeoJSON file, uh, and um, those were not included in our um, vector tile data set. They were actually like overlaid in addition. So um, they and, and those were like self-hosted. But if the data is hosted somewhere and you can pull it dynamically, like it's scraping it, uh, not even necessarily scraping it, just requesting it. Um, so uh, you can make through within the mapping application, you could make a request to that data set. You know, same way you request a web page, but you're actually just requesting data and saying, you know, give me that data. Once that data is received, then you can process it. Um, in terms of it being, I mean, like, so my favorite example of this is the USGS earthquake data, which actually exists at like a, an endpoint in GeoJSON, and like the URL of like the last day's 2.5 magnitude earthquakes never changes. But every time you hit it, it's pulling in the newest information. So one example of this is um, this map that I made um, that shows uh, 311 calls in San Francisco. And so what this map is, whoa, really? That's not very many. OK, maybe there's something wrong. Usually it's much more than 22, but whatever. Um, so what this map is doing is every time I load the page, it is dynamically making a call to the data San Francisco website and pulling down the 311 calls data. And this uses turf to aggregate it into neighborhoods and then determine which calls are, uh, which topic areas are the most common. So can like on SOMA here and I can see the top issues are street and sidewalk cleaning. And this is gonna change every time I look at it, because the, the data is going to be different every time. But instead of being baked into the underlying tiles, it's actually being overlaid as vector data that I can then interact with with JavaScript. So um, you know, I can then show the calls, and we can see, like, OK, this is a sidewalk defect, uh, hazardous materials and needles. This is where I work. Um, <laughs> a lot of, so the, another fun Oh, damn it, I thought it said noodles. And I was oh. like, oh. <laughs> Definitely not noodles. That would be okay. cool, though. Um, way better has oh, yeah. So one big funny thing about San Francisco that people like to joke about is how our lack of public bathrooms and the prevalence of public defecation. 
So um, it's kind of fun to like go into these neighborhoods and look around and see, eventually get to hazardous materials, human waste. Um, they're kind of all over the place. Um, but yeah, so if, if this data is changing all the time um, and it's being aggregated on the fly. Um, and for the, the spatial analysis nerds in the room, the way that this data is being classified is also dynamic um, based on the Jenks natural breaks data classification. I mean, know that means. So when you have a bunch of data, like if you have you know people's scores in your class from zero to 100, and you want to show it on a map like this with different areas colored in, it's called a choropleth map. You can put the data divisions wherever you want. You can say like the lightest color is from zero to five and the next lightest color is from six to seven, and the next lightest color is from seven to 24, and you can just do it as arbitrarily as you want, but that is actually going to show false patterns in your data. So there's a lot of communication and debate around the psychology of how you display information on a map. So you could, the same way that like you could go to a, um, like a reporter from Fox News and a reporter from Politico go to the same press conference. They're going to write two completely different articles about it because of their institutional bias and the way that they write news. Um, maps are totally the same way. Like you can take the same data and display it a whole bunch of different ways to tell totally different stories. So the reason we have things like standard data classification is to make sure that people don't do that or try to use the best data classification that's going to fit that data and information. So that's happening dynamically with TERP, which is kind of neat. But um, to answer your question, I guess you can totally overlay data from whatever. And in addition, if you wanted to bake that into your vector tiles like underneath, using Mapbox Studio, you can create, you can add custom sources in addition to the Mapbox curated data set and then style them together. Um, other questions? Michelle said, what's up? Yeah. You have a mobile API for geolocating? Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> we have this new GL native, which is very, very exciting, um, which is an open source SDK for fractional zoom and GL rendering on, uh, on native devices. Um, and we have iOS SDK and Android SDK, and both of them the same way like geolocation is built into your browser, like geolocation is built in. So I can come along and pick and mark, put a marker on a open source map. Yeah, totally. You, you, can, you can build a, a map, um, an open source map. So like um, Road Trippers, is anyone familiar with Road Trippers in here? Road Trippers builds this really cool app where you can put in your um, origin destination, and it shows you um, like different attractions along the way um, that are like in your area. Where like I can say like, okay, I'm traveling from Portland to Phoenix, and show me all of the attractions along the route. Um, and you can look it on your phone; it tells you where you are and what's nearest to you, and that sort of thing. And this they use Mapbox; they made this custom style for themselves, and they're using Turf and you know. Yeah. Right, what I'm saying is, yeah, map, you can come with a catalog there and canopy the trees. Oh, sure, yeah. Your phone, totally. So you have the ability to Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, one of my coworkers, I don't have it with me because he has it on his iPad, but he built um, an app where you could draw an area on the map and it would dynamically go and pull in the real estate listings for that area. And then you can like click on any one of them, and it would show you walking directions from your location to that place. It was happening all like dynamically, super fast. He did it for WWDC, and then it like disappeared into the ether behind the Cupertino curtain. Uh, sorry, I have opinions about Apple. Um, so um, yeah, so like we just like touched on a couple different components of the Mapbox stack, and also the open source web mapping stack in general. Like outside of, I mean, I feel like Mapbox, like, yes, we are a private company, but we consume and create so much of the open source tools that I struggle to think of an open source mapping tool that we don't use um, and some part of our stack somewhere. Um, but there's, um, in addition to the, to the APIs I talked about, we have a geolocation API, um, which is, you know, geocoding. We give it an address and it gives you latitude, longitude. We're still filling that out. It's not a global data set yet. Um, and we have a static maps API. If you want a static map dynamically that doesn't pan and zoom, but 
is of an area is useful for things like, um, like someone at LinkedIn was talking about implementing it for like your showing like the what is it your networks like the people in your network but not having it dynamically I don't remember what she, exactly she was talking about but. Um, we also just released a really cool one, which is a map matching API, where like you can go and collect GPX tracks and then load them in, and then map matching will snap them to the OpenStreetMap grid, so you don't have like a weird wobbly line on top of a nice straight line. Um, it's really cool. My colleague Eric Fisher has made these like totally crazy um, GPS related. Um, awesome tools or visualizations of um, with GPS data. So this is a uh, this is geotagged photos from Flickr. And what he did with all these different cities was he took the photo and the location it was taken and then uh, cross-referenced it with the like home location of the person who took the photo to determine whether it was a local person or a tourist who actually took the photo and then created these beautiful maps showing like where do the locals go and where do the tourists go based on this Flickr data. Um, and so he does crazy stuff like this all the time. Um, I don't remember why I brought this up, but here it is. Pretty cool. You can also like, cause you know, you can take your Strava data or your Runkeeper data or any data that you have and visualize it too. Um, Moves is an app that some people use for tracking like walking versus running and some of my colleagues have built maps that show like where they've walked or ran in the last year based on this data. Uh, and so like we have all this like super highly personal data from our mobile devices and it's like cool to be able to take it and like visualize it or show patterns or whatnot. Um, so I've been talking for like an hour and 20 minutes. I know that there's like 25 minutes left. Um, but what might be cool if y'all are into it, maybe you've seen a cool mapping project online, and you are curious now to know how it works. And we can look at them and talk about that, or we can break early, or you can ask more questions, or other things. I don't know, what do y'all want to do? Oh, yes. Um, you put the URL by which we can. Oh, uh, no, I didn't. Mapbox, API, and Mapbox Studio. So, um, if you, the, Mapbox.com is a lovely place to start. Um, and if you go to our developers page, uh, right there at the top, it kind of is a nice list of all the different tools that I've talked about. Um, and inside of this web services link, one of my jobs at Mapbox, I've been wearing there since January, is to like consolidate our documentation and information. It's sort of a mess. But um, it's not as bad as it could be. You know, some projects it's just like they don't even have documentation, at least we have that. Um, so uh, there's this page, but we also have a bunch of guides. If you go to mapbox.com slash guides. And these are more tutorial based kind of step-by-step -step walkthroughs based on you're new to the stack and you want to understand it, or you want to focus more intently on designing a map with Studio, or you want to learn more about Turf, which I recommend. I, I really like the, the Turf stuff that we did. Um, I think it's really fascinating. Turf also is cool because in the Turf documentation itself, there is a little code sample for each function, and it's a little mini REPL, and you can actually edit it. So, um, like, oh, this is a bad example because we show a map. It's my centroid. So this is a centroid function. You give it a shape, and then it will show you centroid. But I can come in here and then actually change these numbers. It's actually changing the shape, and it's like <laughs> dynamically changing the map. So it's a fun little ground to play in, um, to play around with. This is, you call it problem. <laughs> uh, kink, not great. Not good for measuring things. But, um, you know, these are fun to play around with too if you're trying to understand especially how like curve functions fit together, or like what it even means to do a centroid, or those sort of things. So I really like this this year. Um, oh, I mentioned I was talking about map time. So map time groups are hands-on beginner-focused meetup groups for learning about all of this stuff. 
Um, we have, I started the second chapter after San Francisco here in Portland like two-ish years ago. And um, we now are up to 65 chapters all around the world. So wherever you live, there probably is chapter, or if not, then you can start one. Um, the whole idea is it's like a knitting circle, but for making maps. And it's beginners teaching beginners. And it's really awesome to be able to be like, yo, I heard about this turf thing, and like, I don't get it. And like, what is spatial analysis? But it seems cool, and I want to play. And oh, it looks like you're playing around with it, too. Let's talk about it. Or maybe you spend 20 minutes playing around with turf, and you're like, whoa, this is awesome. I want to show other people how to do this. And then you go to map time and like actually teach it to other people, which is really fun. Um, that's how I've learned a lot of things, is like by saying, you know, I want to teach that. I think it would be interesting, and I haven't seen a good resource. But that means I have to learn it. And then you learn it, and then you teach it. I didn't know any of this before last night. Exactly what I did. <laughs> I'm just kidding, that's not true. Um, I don't want to set unrealistic expectations. But um, but yeah, there's um, Map Time is super cool, and it's a really great community, big global community. Our newest chapter is in Tanzania. Dar is there one in Portland? There is one in Portland. They meet, their um, meetups are on Calligator. They meet once a month at the Esri Portland office over here on Southwest 6th. Uh, Wednesday or Thursday, I don't know, it's on the thing. And usually, the, I mean, every meetup is a little bit different. New York does like more project nights, and in San Francisco and Oakland, we do more tutorial based, but here in Portland, it's pretty casual. People just kind of show up, and they, they do a lot of show and tells, and like, I built this thing, it was weird, but I tried it, and it kind of failed, but it was cool, let's talk about it. So, um, app type is great. Uh, yeah? Where are you seeing the most demand for maps coming from? Developers who do mapping—is it industry? Is it um, government? Is it totally? Um, the government market is sort of locked up with a proprietary company, Esri. Um, they kind of have a nice little chokehold on the government market. Although you're seeing more and more that like Esri doesn't make tiles that are optimized for Retina screens. So if you have a Retina machine, they're going to be pixely. So more, you know, if you're especially building like, and they're all, they're their online offerings are slow. So a lot, some agencies are like ahead of the curve, um, but it's more definitely more industry. A lot of like, we, we just signed a big deal with MapQuest to power their maps now. So no longer will we have to deal with the the massive big images from the panel panel. Um, and uh, you know, like uh, Uber, Lyft, um, these kind of apps, Postmates. You know, all of these. This is more like San Francisco kind of gross tech culture thing to have things delivered to you on demand. But it's a thing that you can do, and people use it for that. You also see like um, imagery in particular fascinatingly used in like agriculture, because with imagery and remote sensing, you can, if you have a lot of land, you can kind of see how crops are doing with new imagery. We have a new project called Landsat Live that's processing live Landsat data every day. Um, They're running the combine. Pardon? They're running the combine harvester. Maybe. <laughs> um, yeah, the, uh, well, so chlorophyll likes to reflect near infrared light. So you, when you're collecting imagery, you're not just collecting the visible color spectrum, you're collecting the whole spectrum. Mm -hmm. And so you can take one of the color bands in your imagery and say, I want this color band instead of showing visible blue. I want it to show near infrared, and then you can see like vegetation, and then you can measure those changes over time. Wow. So uh, that's like that's been you know the imagery and photogrammetry stuff has been happening for so long, and it's like so cool. And then there's this like awesome data called LIDAR, which stands for light detection and ranging, or yeah, light detection and ranging. It's like sonar but with lasers, and like fly little planes, and then you kind of pepper the ground with laser shots, and <laughs> Exactly, they make that sound. And um, then you wait for the, um, the there's like a, a receiver that measures the time it takes for the light to return. Like a bat. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> totally, no, totally like a bat. Um, and then, so then you get these like amazing point clouds. There's a company here in town called Quantum Spatial, and one of the big things that they do is they go and they look at these point clouds and they pull out artifacts from them. Like maybe there's a bird in your way, 
probably not part of the like ground elevation to have this like weird suspended thing in the way of your flight. Um, so they do like correction on that and then produce derivative interpolated data sets that you can then use for like, when I worked at the Department of Geology, we used them for modeling um, flood scenarios. It's like super accurate ground data beyond just like USPS topographic maps. So if you're a homeowner, LiDAR is your friend or your enemy, depending on whether or not they put you into or out of a flood zone. Mm -hmm. Yes? So are we use PostGIS. Mm -hmm. Are there tools that like help translate back and forth between this and? Totally. We have a guide. Um, so the question was uh, they, uh, using PostGIS, PostGIS, which is the spatial extension for Postgres databases. Can that integrate with Mapbox tools or these tools generally? Uh, Mapbox Studio in particular, we have um, a guide specifically for using PostGIS data. Um, in uh, studio and creating vector tiles from it. So, uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned mapping for disaster relief. Uh, yeah. Can you talk about that a little and sure. maybe about how, how to get involved in that? Jessica, do you want to talk about it? I'm actually sick. So. Oh, okay. Never mind. Um, <laughs> just working with the humanitarian open street map mm -hmm. team. So, um, the Humanitarian Open Street Map team um, is a group of paid slash volunteer, right? It's both paid and volunteer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and their job is to do activations for disasters. And there's a lot of, I don't know as much about this, and I apologize for those who do know more than I do, but um, the idea is in addition to um, activating like armchair mappers, which is like you and me sitting in our living room imagery, but also people on the ground to provide more localized information. So the big example of this was in Haiti in 2000, what year was Haiti? 10? Um, where uh, there were folks on the ground who were collecting text messages sent from locals in Haiti about where there were relief stations and where there was damage. And then there were volunteers actually translating them from Creole to English such that armchair mappers could then map them on the map for um, disaster relief. And they have this amazing tool called Tasking Manager, tasks.hotosm.org. And what this is, is it takes an area, it breaks it up into chunks of blocks and says, um, these are the areas that we need mapped. Um, and so what you can do in the tasking manager is you can say, okay, I will claim responsibility for this little square. And I'll say, you know, based on the instructions about what they, you know, what, what do you need to map? Roads, buildings, settlements, waterways. And then it has all this guided information about how to identify these features. Then you can say, okay, I'm gonna take this little square. I'm gonna start mapping. Oh, I'm not logged in. But if I was logged in, I could start mapping and then that square is locked for me and I'm the only person editing there. And then when you're done, say, I'm done, and then someone validates it. Um, so the tasking manager is like the best way to get involved with those kind of projects. Um, just because it's like very clear and targeted. There are also four times a year are um, nationwide edit-a-thons. So like seasonally, there's an edit-a-thon where a bunch of people will get together all in a room and maybe there's a theme, maybe there's not. The last one I went to in San Francisco was focused on accessibility, so like mapping curb cuts and um, area, you know, because uh, you could directly put anything that's not temporal data in COVID street map. So mapping curb cuts is really useful if you were trying to do like wheelchair routing, for example, mm -hmm. accessibility routing. Um, and then people get together and kind of edit together and ask these questions. Um, and you can find out more about those via the OpenStreetMap US board website, OSM US. And they post blogs about like when that's happening. And Portland has a huge OpenStreetMap community, partly because of this TriMap project, but also just because there's a lot of open source mapping people here in Portland. Um, and that stuff all ends up on Caligator, um, and they do big, awesome events around editing. And then like in San Francisco, like the Sierra Club will take people out, go hiking, and collect GPS tracks to then put the trails into OpenStreetMap as well. So there's all kinds of options to get involved with this project. Yeah. yeah. Do you have an API or any examples for doing temporal changes? So um, changing country boundaries and countries changing over time for you. Oh yeah, that is interesting. Um, we don't have a data API. Um, 
right now. Oh, for example. Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, like, yeah, we don't have like an active like update. It's like um, we're something we're working on in the future. But um, I think like there's a a bunch of projects like in OpenStreetMap that are kind of like on the fringes of it, including Open Historical Maps is one of them, and um, there's also like extracts over time. Like if you can like find the data, then you can do all kinds of crazy cool stuff with it. Um, you have to roll it. Yeah. yeah. Um, so on the Mapbox.js page, we have a bunch of examples. And um, speaking of like adding kind of temporal data, one of my favorite examples is um, this. It's loading. It, the marker is. This is following the uh, Landsat satellite. So the marker is being updated. Yeah. And the marker is being updated as the satellite is moving. So this is like live real time data. Um, so this kind of stuff is like totally possible. You can also like do kind of weird stuff like animating flight paths and doing all kinds of crazy stuff. Drawing and animating a while on a map. This one is based, it's a similar, it's the same idea, but this is literally like predefined coordinates drawing a line on the earth. So there's all kinds of options and crazy stuff you can do, um, and maps are awesome. So like there's like infinite possibilities, and it's like such a like new burgeoning world. There's like not oh I, I keep noticing like oh that thing doesn't exist probably because someone tried it and it didn't work. But more <laughs> than often more often than not it's that like no one's tried it yet. So um, always cool fun stuff to learn and build. Um, yes. Other worlds. Other worlds. So. With these yeah. tools, if you wanted to, we have a, a map that we did of uh, the Mars surface, actually, it's really cool. Um, but it's sort of artificially mapping that big world or other planet to um, geographic coordinates um, on this one. So like zero, zero, which is Null Island, where bad data goes to die, um, just off the coast of, actually like right there. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, it has a cute old website and stuff. Um, so no, I, you'd have to say like, what is my zero zero point in this fake world? And then like, you can map image tiles on top of it. So uh, XKCD did a really cool one once, um, where um, I don't know if any of you saw this XKCD long ago, but this actually is using Leaflet to um, draw you see the tiles loading. Um, to uh, create this, and so it's being mapped to like real world coordinates, even though it's just an image. I like it. It's fun to play with. You can get lost doing it forever. Yes. We need to do this in the next 15 minutes. <laughs> um, uh, to be perfectly honest, my uh, throat congress have been talking for an hour and a half. So um, I think I'm going to end it a little bit early. Um, I have stickers, I have cards. You can come and talk to me or to each other because maps, oh my god, maps. What? Maps are great. Oh, wait. This is my contact information. I'm Lizzie Diamond on Twitter, Lizzie at mapbox.com. If you have any questions about maps or anything spatially related, I can probably help you. So thank you so much for sitting through this. I appreciate it.